Thanks for tuning in to the Just Go Play podcast, where we look to develop and promote a positive youth sports experience. As always, we are available for speaking and private engagements and can be reached at info at justgoplay.ca. You can also catch full video versions of our podcast on our YouTube channel. And don't forget to visit us at justgoplay.ca. Enjoy the episode. Hi, everyone. Coach D here, Daryl Devonish. Welcome to the Just Go Play podcast. We got a great episode for you today. I'm here with Bob Grant, one of the coaches from the North Toronto Hockey Association in Toronto. And we got, oh my God, I have so many questions to ask him. He doesn't even know how many questions I have to ask. I'm going to put him under the hot light. Before we get started, Bob, thanks for being here today. I appreciate no it. I, I, you got a wealth of, of experience that we'd love to share with everyone today. Just to get started here, Bob, can you give us a little of your backstory uh, like as a coach, as a player, uh, just some of your experience, just so the audience can get, get a feel for who you are? Absolutely. Well, I, I grew up in Toronto. I started playing hockey, um, what they would call church hockey. Now that goes back a long way. But um, then I started to play in the original North York Hockey League, which uh, a team called the Western Dodgers. Ooh, and, those guys wow <laughs> yeah so i mean that's <laughs> again a long time ago but the reality is um i ended up playing for a team called the butterbees and people go what, what is that a honey team vibe or what what was that <laughs> so it was the first first marley team in the marley organization oh. um, and then uh i went on to play what they called junior b in those days which uh i played for a team until i injured my shoulder um, which I was around 17, 18 years old, a team called the Dixie Beehives. And <laughs> the Dixie Beehives were a bit of a famous team in the Junior B League, but that goes back to the late, I almost, don't want to say how far back, but it's in the late 60s. So um, my hockey career kind of ended then, but um, from then until I had uh, our, our kids, um, I played the, the usual rec hockey, that type of thing. And then um, I got and started getting involved when uh, Tim and Pete, my sons, um, were somewhere around five, six, seven years old and enrolled at the North Toronto Hockey Association. And then it, <laughs> then it all began. But the, the reality was I started coaching house league. And then uh, when Tim and Pete advanced into, uh, well, they did select hockey. And I started to coach them at that time. And then uh, they went on to be playing. Uh, my younger son went on to play AAA hockey. And then my uh, Tim, as you know quite well, was playing uh, a pretty high level AA at North Toronto. Um, but at that age, I stepped away from coaching. And then I got involved coaching um, some select hockey at North Toronto, but not with my kids. And then since around 1993, 94, I've been coaching select hockey um, single A hockey, double A hockey, because uh, I've always coached at North Toronto Hockey Association. So um, I'm very loyal to them and, and uh, really enjoy the play. So that's in a quick synopsis. That's sort of what my background is. Bob, great. I, I, I got to I gotta ask because I'm a little bit of a historian. You, you got to tell me when you were playing back in your junior hockey would, was there a triple A, double A, and all that stuff there? Would you have been playing the equivalent of triple A back then? Well, back then, as I said, that first team, the Butterbeats, would have been considered would have been considered a triple A team. But in those days, they did not have a, a designation between triple A, double A, single A, or select. It didn't didn't exist. It was just that uh, these teams were the ones you heard about, and that's the teams you wanted to try out for. Were they and, community? Was it at your community or was it like, did you have to travel? Yeah, you had to travel. And quite frankly, um, I used to travel by bus. So I didn't. Games, yeah. my, parents, my parents just said, if you want to play, go play. And they, they would show up occasionally, but generally the, either I would take the bus or the coach would drive you. And wow. it, you can't do that today. But the reality was that if you were, passionate about wanting to play the game you would associate with some of the kids in the neighborhood and they say well this is the team to go to so and that's the team you'd go to and there was really no organization until the north air hockey league came along 
and then they had designated teams and you ended up trying out for ones that were generally in your area. So I hope that explains it. Yeah, somewhere. no, that that's like, it sounds like it was just open with like a lot of like free play and then with a little bit of organization. It, was, it didn't sound like it was like, okay, here's the path. You got to play select hockey. Then you got to make the, the select team and then hopefully oh. rep. So, so it was no, we played there. There was a small organization in the area called the LPAA, which is the Lawrence Park Athletic Association. So that was a very small community, which we played outdoors. Ah, and it was like, was it just pick teams? Were there coaches? Or yeah. Was this... yeah, there was coaches, but they were usually the fathers. But I mean, it was, it was organized, but not really. You right. know, if you showed up and if there was enough guys, you had different sweaters. But the, it was it was a great way to learn the game because you're outside. And if you didn't keep moving, <laughs> you got pretty damn cold. So but, you, I mean, it shows you how far back that goes. Because I, I think my kids, when they played outdoors, they would go, oh, my God, we got to play outdoors. Right. Unless they were playing shinny around the corner, um, they didn't play outdoors. But um, <laughs> the, the beauty about how I grew up in hockey was, uh, and I'll probably get off topic here, but oh, no. the, co the coaches that coached us yeah. were purely, purely volunteer and purely interested in the game of hockey. There was no agendas with their kids. There was nothing like that, okay? And, and as you know, as well as anybody, um, every year that goes along, especially in the GTHL or in, in these quality leagues, it becomes more serious and more serious and more serious. And th those are the type of things that I do not like. Yeah. And, and it, it gives hockey a bad name. It, it, it definitely gives hockey a bad name because there's some people that won't put their kids in hockey because they don't want to experience that. You know, well, when it gets like that. being coaching at Norton for so many years, there's a lot of kids. I mean, they're not kids anymore, <laughs> but when they, they run into me, on the street or at the rink or whatever. And they say, hey coach, how are you? I hardly recognize it anymore because they're so damn big. But the reality is you would love those kids to come back to North Toronto and throw their hat into the ring to do some coaching. Right. And occasionally, occasionally that happens. But the other thing that's happening, and it's been happening for a long time, these kids come back who were very good hockey players. Um, they're finishing their university, they come back. What do they end up doing? They end up going to teams that pay them. So the actual volunteer coach is becoming an extinct thing, other than potentially the parents who are coaching their kids. Uh, I see. And I got a question later on to ask you about the volunteer coach, but I don't want to, I, I want to get back to the topic. So For sure. last, last piece, just as you were growing up, did you have aspirations to be a pro hockey player or was you it did. the love? You, Oh, oh, I could have been a pro if I didn't wreck my shoulder. Doesn't everybody say that? <laughs> yeah, of course you could have. That's what I thought. I was like, that was, this, that was the thing. I was waiting for that in your story. I was like, it must have been the shoulder that deterred him. Through well, I think, I, I think there was, there was a, a, a few of the guys that I played with who went on to, uh, they didn't go on to the big leagues, but they definitely played in leagues like the American Hockey League or the East Coast Hockey League. They weren't called that in the, in the day, but they played in the minors but they never made, they never made the, big, the big show or anything like that. Okay. And you were probably just as good as them. Absolutely. <laughs> I, knew but that, that, yeah. <laughs> I knew that was coming. I had, to, I had to add that for the audience. Well, I, I think as, as a kid, if you grow up, no matter what sport it is, you're always dreaming or thinking, all right? I, and my kids thought the same thing as, as they would. All right? kids do. All, all kids, when they start out, they, they look up and they're like, man, they that's have to. One. Yeah, they, yeah. And that's what they aspire to until I think parents or coaches destroy that dream for them. Well, I, I, again, I, I think as, as a coach, one of the philosophies has to be, has to be, and it has to be a very high percentage, is there has to be a fun quotient. You cannot, you cannot, because the kids are going through school, the parents are on their case, blah, blah, blah. You go to the rink, I don't, they don't want their coach on their case. No. You, want it, you want them to be disciplined and you, and you want to get what you can out of them, but you better have some fun with those players or they're not going to come back. 
and especially as they get older. Now, again, I'm off topic again, but. No, you're not. Bob, you're speaking to the choir right now. This is what we, we, we promote, uh, development and fun. Well, again, it's so easy to say those things as a coach, but the reality is when I'm on the bench and the other coach is either across the other side or he's beside me on the other team, and I can tell you in five minutes if their life is defined by being a hockey coach or just being a volunteer coach or just a coach and their life is around their family or what work they do. But then you run into these coaches whose whole philosophy is if we don't win the game, someone's going to pay a price for that. Right. And that is absolutely, and I've had more debates and more arguments with coaches on that side of the bench who act that way. Well, I think that's where they get their self-worth, some of them, right? It's, it's more about them. It's about their egos. Well, <laughs> again, sorry to, sorry to interrupt, but my, my two sons were, were very good athletes. But academically, yes, they passed and, and were able to go to university, but they weren't the stars academically. There's no question about it. But I'll tell you something. If they playing sports, in particular hockey, that's where they caught their self-esteem. Oh, There's yeah. no question about it. Their work ethic. It, it, well, yeah, but you also learned that occasionally you do lose a game. Right. And you, you, you have to learn how to lose as much as you have to learn to win. And, and, it's, and work with other people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So that, that's amazing. Again, this is exactly what I knew you'd be a, a great guest with, with, with this kind of talk. This is the kind of talk we want parents to hear, coaches to hear. My, my next question and, yep. you know, is the pandemic. Right now, we're in a pandemic. What are you doing right now presently with North Toronto? Are you guys, well, you guys getting back? You're practicing? You're trying to piece things together? Well, I think the last one you said, we're trying to piece things together. The, the head of the GTHL committee at North Toronto, uh, Rich Bruda, a good man. And uh, he, he's kind of reached out to me. And, and the, the idea with him is, Bob, I'm going to put you in touch with some of the coaches who are working through this pandemic. And we, we, you know, we'd like you to, to kind of mentor them through this. Now, mentoring them through a pandemic, I've never done before, but right. nobody has. Nobody. But the reality is to try to keep, uh, keep your feet on the ground and go, go easy with this stuff, okay? Because at the moment, I think that they can have 10 players and possibly another 10 and play three on three. Um, I don't know if that starts now on October 7th, I think, something like that. Right. And uh, so I'm, I'm helping them with the drills. And, 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 and potentially talking to some of the parents just to relax, okay? And, and send your kids out. Uh, you can't necessarily sit and watch them, but be, be, have good faith on what the coaches are trying to do. And um, the, coach, the, the drills that we're trying to design are ones where there's not a lot of physical contact. But um, these kids want to play the game. Yeah. And you're out there as much as you try not to do this. It, it happens. I mean, they're, they're, they're running into each other and they're that kind of thing. But, um, uh, you know, social distancing on the bench and this type of thing is not easy to do. But the reality is, the reality is um, everybody's trying to do the right thing with this. And um, I think as time goes along, uh, hopefully, we'll be get, try to get back to, to something called the, the new normal. And uh, any good hockey association is going very slow with it. You know, yeah. you, your teams are all virtually set up, but I, I don't want them pushing too hard on this. I want them on the ice, but as far as competition is concerned, maybe within, in your own team, that's fine. But if you start to organize games, you have to be careful with that because I know there's unsanctioned leagues out there. Yes, that's definitely happening right now. And, and that's, that's for the diehards that think that they're going to miss something or they're going to fall behind. Um, you know that, you know, we, I don't want my kid to lose the edge, right? So this is, you know, and, and then there's some people that saying, this is my opportunity to catch up. If I play in one of these unsanctioned leagues, I, I, can, I can get my kid up to snuff. He's, you know, he was a little behind, but now that everyone's off, I can sort of. Well, know. you know, it, it comes down to, I remember when Tim and Pete were, 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 we're playing sports and uh, uh, the hockey season would end, you know, in May, let's just say, in April, May. And what did they do after that? Now, a lot of kids today 
it ends in May, but by mid-May, they're playing three and three at Chesswood. And, and they're playing those leagues all through summer. And then they go to a hockey camp. And then, oh, we got training camp mid-August. Where we go again? And that's single A, double A. Well, of course, triple A never stops. But, but my kids played soccer and some baseball. And we did play some three on three, but we cut it, cut it back. Now, again, I'm not trying to pass judgment on what parents do. Don't get me wrong. Because generally the kids say under, under 13 or 12 years old, A, they're controlled by their parents anyway, but B, generally the ones that are into the game love to go to this stuff. Right. Well, so we, I don't mind that, but. The, the challenge we have been seeing or, the, or what we've been seeing though, Bob is, early specialization and the kids are getting burnt out and lots of overuse injuries. What we're, you know, what you did with uh, your kids was you taught them how to be athletes that when they went back to hockey in, in September, October, they missed it. They missed playing. They got an opportunity to, to be athletes and try another sport and, and, and from another dimension, which a lot of time transfers over those skills. So, we're trying to tell parents, it's like, hey, you, if, if you specialize your kid too early, A, he's not going to love the sport by the time he's 13. B, he's probably going to have an overuse injury. So, you know, you're, you're, you're right when you say it's, it's up to the parents, but they need to be educated that that's not always the best thing. for, well, for You and I both know there are some special kids. I mean, yeah. you put their skates on, they probably never take them off for, for 12 months. And, and that's all they want to do. So if you have a son or a daughter like that, fantastic. But reality is the dream tie is hard. So some of these parents, especially when the kids are 13 and under, 14 and under, um, they're not letting their kids take their skates off. And it's, it's a big mistake. It's a huge mistake. But as I said, I'm not going to pass judgment on what parents do with their kids. But I'll tell you one thing, when I'm on the bench, and I see these kids that have been skating all summer. By November, they're tired. But the kids that just started again in September or late August, they're just, they're just moving. That's halfway through the they're season. They're just getting into gear. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. No, no, I agree. And, I, and I've seen that with different athletes that I've worked with myself. So I want to I wanna move this along. And yeah. The next question I want to ask you is, is about your leadership style. So what, what kind of leadership style would you say you have uh, as a coach? Um, uh, you know, how did you coach? Were you one of those, it's my way or the highway kind of guys? Or you were like, all right, guys, here, here's what we got to do. Well, here, here. Yeah, I, I think how that you say you, you, your there, was a coach, there was a coach that coached my son, Peter, at, at uh, North Toronto AA at uh, uh, Minor Pee Wee Pee Wee, which I guess, I forget the ages now. but. Um, uh, Ian and I w would watch him because at that point I was still starting to coach and I'd watch him when he was behind the bench and my god he was intense but he was intense but he'd be laughing and the kids would kind of react to it in a very positive way and I learned that you roll the lines you do not specialize so when a power play comes up, next five out, you just keep doing. You got to the kill comes, you keep yeah. just keep running. And I would watch him and other teams that would play because they were a very good team and they get into tournaments, they get into the playoffs, and the kids that never were able to do the PK or the PP on our team, just roll it, just roll it. The kids were always happy because nobody, nobody, ever had to sit. And that's the number one rule. Now, again, I'm not perfect. <laughs> no, you no, get in the no, last no. two minutes of a game yeah. and you're in a city championship, chances are there might be a, one or two kids who may not see that last two, three minutes. I'm not suggesting that wouldn't happen. But 95%, 98% of every game, we rolled the lines, rolled the lines, rolled the lines. Because when my son played AAA, they had six kids. That right. They'd play 75% of the time. Every game. Every game. So I also learned, and it was Ian's comment, he said, you play at the level where you can touch the puck. You don't play at a level 
because your parents want three A's. You play at a level where you get out in the ice and you actually are able to maneuver the puck, take the puck, make a pass. Because you would see it in, in, in some of these teams where he gets a pass, and he hardly ever touches the puck and it explodes on his stick and he just gives it away. And he should be at a different level or she should be at a different level. I agree 100%. And I know Ian. Ian is an awesome coach. I Listen. <laughs> I didn't use his last name, but you I, probably I know, know. But I know him. I'm not going to say his last name either. I, I'll have to give him props anyway. He's awesome. Yeah. He's yeah. a great quality coach. And, and, and it shows, it, it, I know what kind of leadership style you talked about. He, he presents what he's giving you and he's, he, he, he gives them the job. And he's like, guys, here's what we got to do to be successful, basically. And you go out there and you do it. He practices it and he shows you. Yeah, if I made it interject, every player goes on the ice. Occasionally he's going to make a mistake. Yeah. That's how goals go in generally. And when they come off the ice, and if the coach is, is berating that player, you darn well know that kid the next time he goes out is probably going to make the same mistake. You're so worried about it. But when they come in, they, I always make a suggestion is, what do you think? Do you think we try this next time? And we kind of laugh about it. Right. And the next time he goes out, he'll come in to me and say to me, coach, did you see what I did then? I said, that was awesome. And you kind of make them feel sort of, don't worry, mistakes happen. But some of these coaches, they're so damn serious that it, I, I, as I said, their coaching, what being a coach is defining what they want to do in life. And if they're not winning, I, I don't know if I'd want to, I don't know if, if I was a parent that I'd want my son or daughter on that team. I, I would probably remove them because they're not going to want to come out next year. They're not going to want to do that. So I've been five years in a row and and uh we have the, a lot of kids come out for tryouts because they hear from the other kids on our team that hey come here we're, we're having a riot out here right. and it's not because we lose every game or win every game that's not what it's about again here i'm i shouldn't go on like this but the reality <laughs> is if you if they're having fun and they come out and they say hey coach how's it going and, and you talk about other things other than hockey and when they get on the ice, yes, we have problems sometimes. Kids get too many penalties. They mouth off too much. But the reality is, I don't think I've ever had any kid come to me at the end of the year and say, I'm not coming back. You, you know what, Bob? I can tell as a coach, you were a connector. You're probably connected with a lot of the kids and, and you could relate to them. And, and you, may, like, you know, I can just hear it in how you're talking right now about the stories. You made it fun. And you kept it light, but you, you knew when to turn it on and like, hey, let's go, guys. We, 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 we got a shot here kind of thing. That's what I feel. You, just listen to you talk. I don't know. Am I wrong? Is that, is that the kind of coach you might have been? Well, I, I, I think, I, think um, I don't like to, to say what I was like, but I, I think the ones that I would try to duplicate were the ones that, who, who were like that. And because I know what, how my kids reacted to certain types of coaches. And, you know, Pete had one in AAA who did nothing but shorten the bench. Nothing. Right. And he had a kid, admittedly, who played in the NHL, David Bolin, and a great, great hockey player. But you don't win a game with one player. And, you know, I saw this for two years, and, and Pete would get the ice, but it became to the point where he was scared when he went on the ice. If he made a mistake, he knew he wasn't going back. Right. So, Not I mean, they're 10, 10, 11, 12 years old. Come on, man. Well, so, that's we put him at the level. So we put him at a level, a double A, where he he was extremely good, and his self esteem returned, and he went out and played other sports. He wasn't worried just about playing hockey, and it it makes him very well rounded people. I love it because you know we often say here on the Just Go Play podcast that sport is just a dress rehearsal for life. And it sounds like your, your two boys got a lot out of that. Like, well, they took it. Believe me. Believe me. Yeah. The dream dies hard. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh, and yeah. you, there, there's families out there who are still, the kid's 16, 17 years old, and, he, and the minor midget draft came out, and he didn't get drafted. So now he's playing midget hoping to get drafted. And I'm thinking, maybe, maybe. But, man, 
I don't know. Uh, I, there is a definite different philosophy of how I look than some people look. Oh, yeah. Did, did you get a chance to coach your boys yourself? Or did you yeah. get away from When that? they were really young. I yeah. Did. yeah. Yeah. And it, it wasn't something that I really enjoyed. Okay. And, you know, I see that I would say 70% of the coaches who are out there are parent coaches. Right. Okay. And it's, it's okay. It's, it's difficult for the coach. I know that. But oh yeah, are... just how you treat them. You don't want to show like your any favoritism. Like I, I've coached a few of my kids, um, and it's not easy. You, no. you don't want to be too hard on them. You don't want to look like like I said, you're showing any favoritism. And I find like like I jokingly say, they listen to fifty percent of what I say because they can't see me as their coach. I'm still their dad. And it's just like I joke around with my wife. I go, you listen to 50% of what I tell you. I just don't know which 50% you're going to listen to. That's so, right. That's so right. it was always tough coach, coaching my own guys. And I, what I did was I found, and, and maybe you did this, I found coaches that sort of saw things the way I would see. I, I, that's the kind of coach I would want to be for my kid. Or for I'd sure. Want. Those are the kind of guys I set my kids up with. That I yeah, but understand, understand this, up, up until, at least this is what I've seen, up until they're about 13, 14 years old, the kid is not controlling this. No. The parents are controlling this. And if the parents, along with the son or daughter, are talking about things, generally, as they go through it, they'll probably be able to weed out the coaches and the, the association they may not want to go to. But once they hit 13, 14, 15 years old, your son or daughter is saying to the parent, uh-uh, <laughs> right. I'm either continuing playing or I'm not going to play, or this is where I'm playing because my buddies and, and my friends are there. And, and that to me is, is very, very important because they're, they're not going to the show anymore. So wh where are they going to go play? They're going to want to play where their friends are playing. Exactly. And the local associations are where you should try to establish yourself because generally that's where your buddies are going to be playing. Uh, and, and that's, that's you know, it shouldn't I, I, be i didn't make north toronto uh a double a i'm gonna go over to uh goulding park or i'm gonna go over to humberview huskies and i'm gonna make their team but you live over here how are you gonna make buddy and again in the perfect world if you can stay in association when you finish and you go to university and you come back i guarantee you're playing hockey with the buddies you had when you played in the gthl there's no doubt about it and I, I'm a big believer in that community hockey. Play where you live. Yeah. You know I mean? and, and that's that's what I think is is and then you know it leads me into the next thing I want to talk to you about is the landscape of hockey. I think if if you know some people will say hockey's dying. Um, you know, less enrollment, the numbers are down. But I think if they want to win back hockey or get kids to enroll again, I think they gotta really focus on the recreational hockey in their communities. Kids could walk to the rink or, 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 you know, take the bus to the rink. It's not that far and make it fun again. That's how we're going to get people back into hockey and loving hockey. And then if we have more people playing, more people can go on and, you know, they can go on at higher levels or they can keep playing for the rest of their life if they make it fun. So Absolutely. That, that's, Absolutely. that's, you know, in, in your mind, what, what do you, you know, the landscape of hockey, good, bad, or ugly, how, what do you think it, you know, hockey needs to do right now? Well, I, I, I think that um, th this, this um, game of trying to get your kids to do this, uh, but if you have a, a few kids in the neighborhood who just want to play some hockey, just want to play some hockey, they don't care if they're going double A or triple A, just want to play once or twice a week, maybe once a week. You've got to, you've got to try to push the house league system. The house league system is where, it was where things grow anyway. But the reality is if you don't play anything but house league, it shouldn't be, oh, you're only house league. It's not about that. Great point. Great point. I, I, and I just want to write on that for a second. I think we've made playing house league uh, like a sad, like you're a loser. Correct. Like we, Correct. We, need to, we need to glamorize, I think, the house league. And I, I always say we should change the name of it. You shouldn't call it house league. Call it something else, but not not house league because, you know, I, I the joke is, oh, he's a house leaguer or like, 
Well, I think I think that comes that comes from the way the system is, and there's nothing really wrong with the system. But I, I think that if if you had um, 50 kids sitting here who played hockey, one or two might be playing AAA, five or six might be playing AA, another 10 could be single A. But what's the rest of them doing? The majority of them, if they're still playing, but the majority of them are playing house league. What is wrong with that? And they're having a ball. Every time I talk to these house league guys, they're having a ball. Who cares what level it is? You know what I mean? They're not going to make their living playing hockey. They're going to make their living graduating from, from high school and going to university or going to a trade school, whatever they do. But the reality is the hockey has to be an enjoyment factor and the house league will always be more enjoyable depending how you set it up. And I, I don't, <laughs> when my kids went through house league when they were really young, they used to have one select team. And so it was a competition to get on that select team. But if you didn't make the select team, you played house league and enjoyed it dramatically. Now I see them at the age of seven having five select teams. Five select teams. So there isn't any house league player that isn't playing select. And I go, whoa, like, why are you doing that? But again, that's just me, okay? That's just me. No, and no, I, no. This is, this is an issue. But again, you know, the, the select is because they don't want guys to miss out. Like, if you don't have a select team, it's hard. Like, I, I've seen this from this view. If you don't have a select team, it's hard to go for an A or a double A. Or, like, you need something to show, hey. But you don't need to have five of them for the same age group. I agree. I agree. Anyway, that's just, a, again, a bugaboo of mine. No, 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 no. This is this – is, this is part of what's wrong with hockey, though. Because well, I, 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 you know, using the term wrong, I don't know if it's 100% wrong, but I think, I think as challenge. we were just Let's saying. Let's call it a challenge, yeah. Yeah, I think that, I think that uh, uh, if I ever have any grandchildren they want to play hockey, sure, I want them to all go to the play in the NHL. Oh, yeah. Everybody wants that. But yeah. come on, man. I had one kid, one kid. We coached double A at North Toronto in our uh, call-up team was minor peewee. We were peewee. And we had a kid in minor peewee who we call up. And we were always hoping that maybe one of our kids couldn't make the game because then we could call up this kid to play. And it was Tommy Wilson who plays for Washington. Ooh, and wow. yeah, but see, the next year after that, he went to AAA and that was the end of him. But the reality was there's very, very, very few of these kids. Very few. Right. And what you have to keep in perspective is, okay, this is, a, this is a program where there's going to be a lot of good hockey players, but they're not going to the show. There's no question about that. But I, I don't know. I, I enjoy, as soon as I, soon as I hit the rink, this, this, this is my life. I love it. I just, the kids are there chatting with the parents, having fun, you know, in the dress room, joking around, boom, 10 minutes before the game, let's sharpen up guys. Let's do this. Okay. And then off we go. And then, I'm, I always prefer to be on the door. I don't like to be standing behind. I want to be on the door so when they come in, I can joke with them, I can tell them, I can see what, how they're looking in their face. And you get to hear a lot of things going on down there too. <laughs> anyway, sorry I got off there. Oh, I see you love it. Like no one, it sounds like you still love it. Now, I, I want to ask, a, a, we've got a few more questions for you. Sure. What's one of the biggest difference that you see with coaching, you know, back when you played and then now? What's, what's one of the biggest differences that you've seen with the kids? The type, let's, let's talk about the kids. Yeah, well, I, I, think, I think the differences in, in the kids right now is um, they're, they're getting – I used to push my kids. I'm not suggesting I didn't push them. But the, the, the idea that pushing them as hard as you can – uh, I think it's it's overboard too much now. That's that's with the 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 kids saying I want to play hockey, and then they they look like they have some abilities, and then they keep pushing and they keep pushing. And uh, I, I think that you you should try to allow your son or daughter to kind of go along at the level that they would prefer to go along at. Okay, but it's ten times worse now than it was in the days when my kids went through. Um, and it, to me, that they got to back up a bit. Okay. And, and, and allow the game to kind of go the way it would naturally go. 
Because if you put them into a level, and as I said before, you put them into a level which they can, they can maybe just make it, but yeah. they're not playing and they're not touching the puck, then you've overdone it. You've got to bring them back to a level where they're going to be enjoying it and they're going to be part of a team, not just one of the numbers. Yeah. Um, and I think the young, the players that I deal with anyway, because my last few years of coaching were kids that were over 15. And tough age, it, tough age, because there's not, they're, they're, a lot of them have quit. A lot of them quit. A lot of them have girlfriends. A lot of them have jobs. And a lot of them are serious students. Okay. So practices, like two practices a week becomes difficult when you're dealing with single A, double A kids when they get older, because you, you want attendance, but you know, and, they, and you, as you get older, you get the later nights, you get nine and 10 o'clock practice times. And the parents are going, man, I'm not sure I want him going out at 10 o'clock to practice when he's got school at nine o'clock in the morning. So you have to balance this stuff off, but um, you have to, as they get older, you have to understand that the hockey becomes uh, a fun part of their life, not their goal in life. So um, when I, when I step up and coach those types of players, I tend to understand their motivation is a little bit different than two or three years before that. Okay. But I also believe that uh, if you're going to coach these kids, once again, the priority, you have to make sure when they show up and you're with them, that they're, you're talking to them, you're understanding what's going on in their life a little bit, and why they're, what they're doing on the ice is not necessarily a reflection of how they actually play, but they had a rough day today, they failed a physics exam, whatever. But the reality is you, you've got to try to understand your players. And that's more of a coaching than it is knowing the players. Because when they get older, the kids that come out, they are really hockey people. They want to play. They want to play. And their parents are just driving them now. They're not steering the bus anymore. So I, I, I like that type of thing. And, and I think you hit it. I, I think the parent, going back to when you were coaching back in the day or, or when you played, you said it. There was less parent involvement. It, it they play now the more parent involvement is the, the more controlling the more it might be about them and, and their ego and they got to get out of the way of that but and then something happens at 15 16 when they're just dropping them off now they really want to be there because they love hockey and they don't care about the championships and anymore they just want to play well you know when i was coaching my kids were still playing right. so I, i'd coach a game then i'd run out and go and watch them play and I, I would be the guy, especially at North Toronto, there's a rail at the top and all the parents, mostly the guys, they'd be standing on the rail and they'd be yakking at the ref and they'd be yakking and yakking, right? And I used to say to myself, man, I got to watch myself because I'm the guy that's on the bench over there a lot of times and I'm hearing these idiots, okay? But it's, it's hard as a parent not to be involved, but as long as, as, long as it's innocent stuff that goes on, yeah. It's nice to have your mom and dad, and mom and dad love to watch their kids play. There's no doubt about it. But there's always the ones that take it to the next level, and it, it's just it's sad to see because it is a small amount. I mean, you know and I know, you meet some fantastic people. Oh, yeah. I've met some great families, hockey families, and we've exactly. grown up together. It, hockey is a, a family thing. It really is. Absolutely. Absolutely. But it, I mean, it's, it's the sour ones that, that ruin things. And I mean, you and I could tell stories for another hour of some of the crazy parents you meet, but it's at the end of the day, those are the ones that give us a bad name. But at the end of the, uh, the next day, man, there's so many people that I still see and know um, I, I, we've met through hockey that uh, fantastic people, you know, just fantastic people. So um I don't know. I've been very lucky, I think. I think I've been lucky. And, and the coach, it means that I've coached. Um, You've been great for a bunch of kids in North Toronto. The North Toronto organization is, is, is lucky to have you. Well, I think, I think uh, uh, the volunteer coach has become an extinct uh, situation. Um, the, the government is, is, you have to take X number of courses now just to become a coach. And to become a trainer, you almost have to be a nurse. So I, I think that's an unfortunate thing because um, some, some of the people who would do this, they say, I don't really have time to do it. 
And the ones that put time aside, they're now expecting to get paid X amount of dollars to do it. Right. And I, I don't, again, old school, I don't agree with paying coaches. Yeah, no, no. And, and that's, I, I get that. There's, there's a, like a big divide between paying them and whatnot. My only thing with volunteers, Bob, and I'm going to be honest, yeah. if you're a volunteer, you should take a course because I, I look at volunteers like if you were a volunteer for the fire department, you can't suck. No, no, no. You no. can't suck. Like I, 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 I love the volunteer. I, I agree with you. But they should be required to take some courses. I don't, I, I don't think they should have to pay. But I, I think they should take courses so there we get more coaches like yourself who are connectors, who are working on the kids' confidence, who are, you know, building them up and not just trying to win championships. No, I, I don't disagree with that. I think, they're, you know, some of the coaches I've seen, I don't know how they, how they are allowed to be on the bench. But exactly. You're right. You're and right. That, and that, and that's Use the harassment courses are a very good thing, simply from the point of view that maybe some of these coaches, having that pointed out to them, how you shouldn't act, maybe it just turns them on and says, hey, maybe I should calm down somewhat here. Right. So th those courses are very valuable. I, I don't disagree. And, and I think, you know, based on our conversation today, too, I think parents should have to do some sort of courses on how they talk to their kids. Because they, yeah. it not not just what about hockey. It's just how do you talk to your kids? How do you talk them through this hockey thing? You know, or, well, or get out of the way. Well, like, I knew I knew within 10 minutes of every kid on my team how they were talked to when they got in the car and went home. I knew who, which father or mother was going to turn around and just rake them. And you just sort of say to yourself, next time he comes to the rink, we're going to have a chat. And I don't want him to feel bad at what's going on in the ice because if there's no mistakes on the ice, the score remains zero, zero. So uh, this is what happens in a game. It's not a mathematical quiz. It's going to happen out there and you can't sit in the car and criticize your kid because he made mistakes on the ice. And it's, it's unfortunate, but you knew exactly which ones it was gonna to happen to. And you're right about taking a course. Yeah. I think they have one now anyway. Yeah, but I don't think people take it seriously. I, Probably I, not. Yeah, and, and that's why, I, you know, if you don't take this course and you're, if, if you're caught doing these things, if someone's gotta hold these parents and the coaches accountable. Well, when, my, when Pete, my younger son, played um, serious soccer, um, they were playing a game in a tournament in, uh, in Vaughn somewhere. It doesn't matter where it was, yeah. but um, there was a parent on the other team completely harassing the referee, like so bad. <laughs> so the ref went over and pointed at the guy, and the guy knew who he was, and he said, this game is not beginning again until you leave wow and the guy was so embarrassed he turned and left and then they began the game again i would love to see that more in hockey if they have to yeah but you know sometimes they have to yeah hopefully that doesn't go it doesn't get that far but yeah they, these people have to be removed from the game and and you know they're not doing their kid any favors no no, not at all. Not at all. But as I said, I think over the number of years I've been involved in, in, in coaching hockey and taking kids on tournaments and going here and going there, on a scale of 10, the kids think it's a 12. Okay. So it's one of the best experiences any kid can have. Okay. But a, a coach can ruin it right away. Because I mean, a game is 40 minutes, 50 minutes long. How much do you actually get to be on the ice? Maybe 12 minutes? Maybe? Maybe. Right? Okay, and you, you, better, you better not cut that back, okay? Because the parent over there is paying five grand and you're paying five grand. He's getting 20 minutes and my kid's here getting eight. What's going on here, right? It can't be that way, okay? No, and, you, and you've hit on some points that I, I hope our audience is listening and, and, you know, I don't want to discourage people from playing hockey because I know these things are now, they're out in the open and people are talking about them. So. I hope that this now changes how people who are running these teams and organizations say, Hey, this is, we know some of the challenges. Also, to, to, to give it a positive feel, I've, I've met a lot of the organizational people with organizations who set up their committees for the GTHL and, and North York hockey league. And they are wonderful people. And, and they're not getting paid. Most of them not getting paid. 
they're spending hours and hours and hours right. doing this for their kids and for other kids. And they're wonderful people. And, and I don't know how you get them. My wife is still a board member in North Air Hockey League. My kids haven't been playing for 20 years. Yeah. So it, it's, it's those kind of people that keep these things going. And they're great people. So if you get involved, get involved. But uh, no, no, I agree. And I, I just want to wrap up. Yeah. So if you were if you were talking to a kid today, what advice would you give a kid? And I'm going to ask you for what advice would you give a coach? So give you a chance to think about that. What what advice would you give a young kid that was playing hockey today that wanted to play? What would you what would you tell him? Well, I, I, I think that the main thing, if a kid is sincerely wanting to play the game, then the, the best thing they can do is play at the level that they should be playing at. And if, if it's a five-year-old, you're not going to know this. But if, if they're 10 years old, you're probably knowing what level they should be playing at. And they shouldn't be pushed to a level. And I've said this three times now, but if they're not touching the puck, if they're not involved, they shouldn't be at that level. And if, once they get at the level they are, who cares? Who cares? It makes no difference. That's generally what I'd be saying to the kid. But that conversation would be with the parent also. Right. No question about it. Okay. And I would, if I was a parent, I'd be interviewing the coach and I'd be interviewing the manager. And okay. Because these things cost a lot of money and you know, you, you, you want a manager who's, who's going to be, this is what this is costing. This is what this is costing. This is what this is costing. Okay. And as long as it's set up that way, then you shouldn't have any problems down the road. Plus, um, there's always one or two on every team who can't afford the costs. So if I were a parent who was in that position, I would not be, um, I would not then not want to come out and the team. But the interview with the manager would have to have that stated. Because I know at North Toronto, we do help support some of these kids. And I think most organizations do that. Right, right. But uh, I, I think the parent has to interview the coach. I think the parent has to try to realize what level they're going to play. And as far as the kid's concerned, it would be nice if they knew some of the kids on the team. But um, you're going to be spending a lot of time with them. But um, I, I think that most of the kids who want to play the game are expecting that they're going to have to practice hard. All the stuff that coaches try to encourage right cardio and systems and, and skill development that's what we're going to work on and as long as you're pointing this out to them and understand how a practice is going to be run um i i think the kids would be very acceptant of it as long as there's no major um what i call surprises that's a that's a great answer well what would you say to coaches bob <laughs> um i think generally the coaches today are very very well prepared um, uh, when I became a coach, I think there was one course and, and that's fine. I think coaches take and take as many courses as they up to a university degree. So I, I think good coaches today are, are well prepared from the point of view of, of the mechanics of the game. I think where they, they should have, in my opinion, <laughs> I'm an old coach, but I think they should have somebody on the bench who has been, is, who is experienced. Because if the coach starts to go down a road where they shouldn't be going, that guy's going to pull them back, okay? And that, to me, is a huge thing. And I think, they're, I think they should have somebody on the bench like that. Because they're, they're young guys, and they're very, very uh, happy to be doing what they're doing. But the thing aspect has to be put in perspective. Because not every team, not every team is even going to be a 500 team. And if you're losing more than you're winning, you really have to be able to keep the, the enjoyment thing going because I know what happens. And I find that the, I've coached teams that never lost a game and I've coached teams that barely won a game. And if you can try to keep a happy medium as a coach, this has to be talked about to any coach that comes along, okay? Because you can lose the enthusiasm, you can lose the players if you keep losing. So you got to try to uh, make those practices into winning practices, lots of games, lots of things. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> I, love it. No, no, Bob, I love it. And and what I took from that last piece was that these coaches have to find a way to make it fun, uh, make it about the kids, 
building their confidence and they'll get more out of these kids. Yeah. And I think, I think that generally most coaches start that way. Yeah. Okay. They're, they're all, I think, fairly sincere because it's a lot of time commitment, but the, the winning thing gets in the way. And that, that again, I'm not going to try to no, end no, 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 but you, you pay, you pay coaches today, you pay them. And if you don't win, yeah, yeah. Then, then there people are a little problem there. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, that's how they're taking it. They're like, I, I got to win. So that means I'm going to have to shake things up. I'm going to have to play my, 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 you know, top dogs a little bit more. So Correct. It, it becomes Perfect. about the wins. And that's, you know, I think that's the one ingredient that we have to really look at. It's like, can't make it all about the wins. Cause if it's about the wins, you're not going to develop a team. You're going to try and buy a team. Yeah. Well, I think the definition of winning can, can be, can be applied to, to winning and losing. But winning means if your son or daughter leaves that dressing room still with a smile on their face, then you're winning. I love that. Okay. You're winning, yeah. right? But if your son or daughter leaves there cursing what's going on in that dressing room, yeah. and that you won't 11 nothing, <laughs> you're losing. Do you follow what I'm saying? And it, because it's a long year for the coach, too, right? <laughs> oh, shit, we lost again, 8 nothing. But James had four shots on net, and we were scheduled to have only one. He had a big game. So you can turn these things somewhat, right? It's not perfect, but you can do that. And uh, so, I, again, Bob, I love it. That, that is a, a great ending. You know, if a kid leaves with a smile on his face, then you've won. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, this, this is, you know, what our – Jesco plays all about is, is, is finding quality coaches like yourself who who really care about the kids getting something having great experiences and playing for as long as they can in the best environment possible so you know that's why I had you on I, I you know I, I bugged your son I said I gotta get I gotta get your dad on I, I gotta hear have him talk about <laughs> experience. Um, no problem I enjoyed it, it. I thank, enjoyed you. it. thank you guys today uh, if you love this podcast, which I know you will, share it. Share it with your friends. Share it with your families. You know, we were lucky to have Bob. He's a servant leader. Uh, he's been doing this a long time. He's got a lot of experience. And I love, I, you're, you're the, one of the, you sound like the best connector with these kids. And, and anyone who's probably played with you probably remembers you. And they, they, they're probably saying the same thing. He, he, made, me, he made me smile. Uh, he made me like the game. So, well. Uh, you, you, you learn you learn to have a lot of good jokes too. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's true, Bob. It's true. And, and on that note, guys, just go play. Thanks for tuning in. Take care. We'll see you later.